escalated quickly. Two weeks ago, um, as of this recording, a leaked draft of the new OGL, or Open Gaming License, tentatively labeled at the time version 1.1 and now renamed version 2.0, leaked. The previous version, which had been in effect for basically 22 years, served to grant game designers and authors le um, permission and legal reassurance to use the game mechanics of Dungeons & Dragons 3.5 and 3rd edition and 5th edition, but and some but not all of the game's monsters for making their own game materials. This would work whether these materials were things that add onto the game system, like game materials for your own setting, including spells and monsters, or additional adventures that the game master could use. You could even write completely new RPGs based on the core mechanics, with the authors able to reproduce necessary mechanical de detail directly from the system reference document, or SRD, without having to do extensive rewrites. And, cutting ahead to now, because Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition has deliberately had a limited number of releases per year, sometimes even only like four books total, this has allowed third parties to put out a slew of material to help supply D&D game tables. Now, the 1.0a version of the OGL contained a license saying that the game was perpetual. And at the time of the license's original publication in the year 2000, almost 23 years ago, 22, 23 years ago, the writer, writers of role-playing game materials from small independent um, publishers operating out of a home office to corporations with enough staff to unionize, like Paizo, were, took advantage of this. Complete with the license, like the General Public License, or GPL, from where it drew inspiration, um, going on to being applied to games beyond Dungeons & Dragons as a mechanism where publishers uh, could make clear to other companies and aspiring designers that, yeah, you can write game material for our game system, uh, whether that is for Fantasy Age or whether that was for the Mongoose publishing version of the Rune Quest system or whatever. The whole mechanism was meant to create an arrangement where Wizards of the Coast could keep from having to overextend themselves by replicating the churn of massive amounts of gaming material that helped drag down TSR and their multiple game lines by spreading out the financial risk, both through larger publishers like Cobalt Press creating their own settings um, and just generic material in general. Wizards of the Coast also had an existing mechanism for collecting royalties on their own settings as well by opening them up through the Dungeon Masters Guild, not only through reprinting classic material from TSR themselves, but also as rule books and adventures from WotC came out for not only the Forgotten Realms, but also Ravenloft, Eberron, Dragonlance, and Spelljammer, in addition to various Magic the Gathering settings, those settings also opened up on the Dungeon Masters Guild, allowing third-party publishers to create their own material in return for Wizards of the Coast taking a cut on sales. Again, WotC doesn't spread themselves thin, publishers get to play in Wizards IP, and in more than a few cases, authors are able to make concerted efforts to fix some of the more racially insensitive elements of D&D's past, like with efforts to rewrite the al Qadim campaign setting to one that's more racially sensitive. Then, for some goddamn reason, we know what reason, it's greed, Watsi's parent company, Hasbro, in the lead up to the, op to the upcoming 1D&D, decided to score a slew of own goals. A leaked version came out of a revised new edition of the OGL that would nullify the old version, um, invalidating it. This new version would allow Hasbro to take a cut of all revenues above a certain threshold, and that's not profit, that's like, you know, just, that's total revenues. And would also potentially close off game materials from virtual tabletop or VTT platforms outside of Watsi's own D&D Beyond, whose VTT features are still in development and so could potentially not pen out. And also provide more wiggle room for Watsi to claim published setting material under the OGL instead of material that was specifically marked as open gaming content under previous versions of the license. This idea was based on the fact that the OGL specifically only mentioned authorized licenses, 
which Hasbro's lawyers meant that they could deauthorize the old license, which was also stated as being perpetual. To use a hypothetical scenario, if um, Darrington Press, the publishing arm of Critical Role Entertainment, published setting material for the Mighty Nine campaign or Bell's Hells or whatever campaign came after, which would probably be the more likely one, under the OGL 2.0, as opposed to a separate contract for with Wizards and Hasbro, Hasbro could decide that it is well within the terms of their license because it allowed Hasbro and WotC to sub-license this material out to make, for example, action figures of the members of that can of of various characters from that campaign or featured in that rule book, say if they included write-ups of the characters from the campaign without having to pay royalties to the critical role cast or even necessarily get a sign off on what the characters looked like. Now, additional reporting from io9 from sources at Watsi and partners from uh, from sources within Wizard of the Coast himself made it clear that this was deliberately meant to cut off major portions of the third party market by driving them off the license. That's meant to basically force out the cobalt presses who all should mention they wrote a couple adventures for D&D 5th edition at the start of the edition, and as well as third parties like Paizo and that sort of thing. There were additional term sheets provided to major partners that would provide a marketing partnership agreement with and reduce royalty percentages to Wizards of the Coast, but without really much additional room for negotiation. Now, allow me to provide a visual representation of what happened when this story broke. So, probably the biggest thing to come out of this was a bunch of major publishers who rose out of the OGL. Paizo, Cobalt Press, Goodman Games, and Green Ronin, among other publishers, plus some more established entities like Chaosium and Pinnacle Entertainment Group, announced the Open Role-Playing Content License, or ORC designed to be system neutral with publishers able to put forward their own SRDs for their own systems and the license being maintained by a nonprofit. However, as part of all of this and ignore, um, somewhat ignoring the start of Orc, um, or the rise of the Orc, if you will, we got various discussions on the OGL from legal Twitter and various legal YouTube channels, which all came to a common conclusion. You don't need the OGL to make gaming material compatible with D&D and other tabletop RPGs because you can't copyright rules and game mechanics as they are a process. This is true. It's also missing the point dramatically. To understand why that's the case, you need to have some knowledge of the history of tabletop role-playing, particularly in terms of the industry. I've got several sources I'm going from for this video, but if you want a one-stop place to sh go to, I'm going to recommend Shannon Applecline's Designers and Dragons series of books covering the history of tabletop role-playing. The history isn't current up to the present. Their coverage of Watsi stops at the lead-up to 5th edition, for example, but that's not relevant for what I'm covering in this video. Because, you see, part of the reason that Wizards created the OGL in the first place was to encourage people to write for Dungeons & Dragons, and this is in part based on the history of D&D, or rather, D&D's previous publisher, TSR. So, we need to set the Wayback Machine to the 80s, and then skip forward a bit to the 90s. So, after Gary Gygax was forced out of TSR by Lorian Williams due to a combination of Gygax's own arrogance, hubris, pig-headedness, lack of business acumen, obliviousness, and willful ignorance of the business side of his own company, after he'd managed, with Williams' help, to get the company back from underneath the, the control of the Blooms, who were in the process of running the company to the ground, um, Gygax's control streak, long story short, led him to try and undermine all the goodwill they'd gained with TSR's predator, creditors by getting rid of the Blooms in the first place. Goodwill they needed to undo the Blooms' damage and keep the company stable, while they put out product and got the company on a stable financial footing. So, Williams did some very shrewd financial maneuvering, aided again by Gygax having his head up his own ass, as far as the business was concerned, to get Gygax out. For some sour sighting on this, The Game Wizards by John Peterson has a lot of great material on the topic. Uh, if you want a more video version of this, SF Debris has some good videos as well. This is where we are be starting at with this 
particular chunk of history. Gygax, along with some of his allies from TSR, like Frank Messer, went and started a new game company, New Infinities Productions. Gary took with him the rights to his Gord the Road novels, and Metzer had a verbal agreement that he could reprint some existing adventures that Metzer had written for TSR um, in their RPGA that were for, for to be run at conventions and so forth or Dungeons and Dragons. New Infinities also published their own RPG, Cyborg Commando, which both at the time and to this day has a general critical reception of it's fine. I guess for the time, eh, nothing special. However, near as I can tell, TSR had a vindictive streak. I don't know if this is a Lorraine Williams thing, if this is someone in the legal department or elsewhere in management, but the, there was a legal, for lack of a better term, vendetta against Gygax. Gygax had fallen from TSR and they were going to do whatever it took to keep him from coming back, even if he didn't actually stand much of a chance of coming back. So, TSR sued New Infinities over the adventure that Metzer had an agreement to publish, blocking it from publication and tying the company up in court until, ultimately, their legal adventures, expenses forced them into bankruptcy. Gary would try publishing a game again later at Game Designer's Workshop with, their with a new game titled Dangerous Journeys. Originally titled Dangerous Dimensions, but they tweaked the title after realizing that, you know, here after what happened with New Infinities, publishing a fantasy or fantasy adjacent role playing game with Gary Gygax's name on the cover and with the acronym of DD might be tempting fate. Now, at this point, GDW was a fairly established publisher. They'd achieved fame for their long-running Traveler science fiction tabletop role-playing game, one of the first ones to make it big. Um, and the, at this point, they weren't the number one, but the main publishers who were eclipsing them, as far as role-playing games were concerned, were ones putting out licensed games, fast as Star Trek and West End games as Star Wars. They'd also put out a very successful post-apocalyptic RPG, Twilight 2000, which had the players playing as... NATO soldiers and their civilian allies in a post-World War III Europe, where both sides had called an end to the fighting and without a way to get their troops home, both sides, both uh, Warsaw Pact and NATO troops were sent instructions to fend for themselves and figure out how to get back on your, on your own with a side element of, if you want to. Now, when they agreed to do this deal for GDW to publish Dangerous Journeys, they were aware of what happened with New Infinities and were in their contract made sure that if they were sued by TSR, Gary would be responsible for any court costs or damages, not GDW. In that way, they thought their bases were covered. Instead, what happened, um, as Lauren Wiseman, the then head of GDW, has mentioned in interviews and so forth in the past, is that TSR tied GDW up in Discovery for years, trapping their staff into spending more time finding materials for court cases and giving testimony than they were working at making stuff for their games. And to be clear, TSR's claims of similarity to Dungeons & Dragons, what they were suing on, were so nebulous that any and all tabletop role-playing games, um, GDW's other titles, titles from other publishers, including major ones like White Wolf or that sort of thing, would have been impacted by this case, and likely TSR would have lost. But it didn't matter. Deadlines slipped, game books ended up coming out with extensive errors, um, and ultimately GDW was led into bankruptcy because they weren't able to put out game materials that sold well enough to keep the lights on. And then there's Mayfair Games. Mayfair published an extensive line of supplementary materials for Dungeons & Dragons 2nd Edition, or I should say Advanced Dungeons & Dragons 2nd Edition, under the title of Role Aids. Mayfair's management had gotten the legal advice on how to appropriately cover their ass when it came to both copyright and trademark law when it came to Dungeons & Dragons, and so the game books were published billing compatibility with Advanced Dungeons & Dragons, but also crediting who owned the trademarks, and that the books were made without TSR's permission. TSR sued anyway, and Mayfair was able to 
get TSR to settle, preempting a costly court case that would leave Mayfair potentially unable to operate, or a court verdict that would open the floodgates for TSR for a bunch of imitators, or both. Both being the likely actual conclusion. TSR got to, or I should say, Mayfair got TSR to agree to a royalty-free licensing agreement provided certain conditions were met, conditions that Mayfair was doing anyway, and that lasted for a while. However, eventually, Mayfair got the rights to much of the back catalog for another D&D third-party publisher, one of the first third-party publishers, Judges Guild. As part of this, they planned to publish an updated version of Judges Guild's classic D&D campaign setting, indeed, the first published D&D campaign setting, the city-state of the Invincible Overlord. With it, they got a new introduction written for the setting by Gary Gygax. Additionally, because they were trying to do something fancy with the cover, they eschewed some of the trade dress requirements they'd done in the past, but it feels like the involvement of Gary led to a not-coincidental reaction from TSR, and by not coincidental, I mean they sued again. So after two years of legal battles, TSR managed to force Mayfair to sell their Roll Aids line to them, and who, outside of two unpublished books that TSR published under their own name, quietly shoved the rest of Mayfair's game line into a warehouse somewhere. Some of these games aren't even available on PDF. And finally, one more example to bring this all full circle. And for this one, we go to the early days of Wizards of the Coast. Now, Wizards of the Coast, like a lot of game companies, started out putting out modular standalone material for other people's tabletop role-playing games. Um, in some cases, just even like generic material that you can stick into any system. And one of them was a book called The Primal Order, meant to have rules and guidelines for deities and divinity in various tabletop role-playing game systems, primarily fantasy. This included information on how to make the game material work with those role-playing systems, and one of them was Palladium Fantasy Role-Playing. Now, Palladium's publisher, Palladium Entertainment, is a lot more mellow than it used to be. Palladium, for example, recently partnered with Pinnacle Entertainment Group, one of the supporters of the Orc license, to put out an adaptation of their Rift's role-playing game in its setting to Pinnacle's Savage World system, um, which is nice and good because you're getting, because the Palladium House system hasn't changed much since the early 80s. Now, on the other hand, back in the day, Palladium was much more litigious. They had received, arguably bad, legal advice to the effect that and if anyone published game material for any of Palladium's games without a license or converted material from a different game to Palladium system or vice versa, even just, you know, creating mechanical conversion guidelines with no actual setting or fluff material, like the copyrightable bits, not the processes, then that other company or person could claim ownership of the entirety of the game system and attached setting. In other words, the advice they received, from what my understanding of the law is, to keep in mind I'm not a lawyer, was that Palladium thought that the law around game mechanics worked not like copyright law, but trademark law. This may be why Palladium books apply trademarked indicators around pretty much every noun in the game, making them look like an issue of World Wrestling Federation magazine. So... Palladium sued Wizards of the Coast, and the two companies ended up in a costly legal battle that put WotC at risk for bankruptcy, and indeed causing them to spin off their new project that they were working on and had in their development off into another company to protect it, that company being called Garfield Games. It is only due to the intervention of then-president of Gamma, the Game Manufacturers Association, and also the who was also the head of our Talzorian Games, Mike Pondsmith, Yes, that Mike Pondsmith, that a settlement was able to be reached. WotC put out a new printing of the Primal Order with the Palladium Fantasy material removed, along with the D&D material, just to cover their bases there. And Wizards was able to 
continue to exist and put out the new game they're working on under their own name. That game being Magic the Gathering. By any reasonable, reasonable criteria, TSR didn't have a leg to stand on, or for that matter, neither did Palladium in any of these cases. But because TSR was an industry leader and Palladium was one of like the big five, they had the ability to win any and every battle of attrition they put forward. The only time they blinked from TSR's side was the initial Roll Aids case, and that's because they were effectively acting as a more rational actor. Um, they knew that if they did push to the bitter end and Mayfair won a Pyrrhic, uh, Pyrrhic victory by having an official verdict in their favor, even if Mayfair could not capitalize on it and put out game materials, it would potentially open the floodgates. And Mayfair was willing to settle because when all said and done, they didn't want to lose everything. So, the so when TSR had an axe to grind, when, well, Gary Gygax's name got involved, they stopped acting more rationally. That's the reason for having the open gaming license. It provided an olive branch from wizards to their peers in the industry and let other companies provide a similar olive branch because wizards had faced this same sort of threat of legal destruction themselves, and they were aware of the worries that other publishers would have. You can make compatible material for our gaming system. We're okay with that. You don't have to worry about a change in management down the road causing us to unleash the legal hounds. It creates an avenue for trust. And that mattered even more when Wizards of the Coast got bought by Hasbro, a multi-million dollar corporation. The legal expenses when needed to win a battle of attrition against a publisher legally... legally ah, the legal expenses needed to win a battle of attrition against a publisher operating literally out of a basement office or a garage or an attic as a side hustle would not be noticeable on an expense sheet. Against a more substantial company like Paizo or Green Ronin, it might be more significant, but not enough to make a real dent, which makes this retraction of the old OGL all the more a big deal. Because, or the attempt to retract it, because... Hasbro is putting on the table, we're willing to fight these long, dragged out, um, drawn out legal battles again, the kind that killed GTW, that killed Mayfair Games, um, that killed New Infinity's productions, and which nearly killed Wizards of the Coast themselves. Now, Paizo, Green Ronin, Cobalt Press, Goodman Games, Monty Cook Enterprises, they all could win a legal battle on Hasbro against this, but with the, how the American legal system works, it would likely be a Pyrrhic victory. Even if they all went in together and tried to make it a class action suit, um, that would require the judge to give approval for that to be a, does a class action suit. And still putting a significant financial risk because also they'd be could potentially putting aside the financial costs, have their staff get dragged down when discovery, preventing them from putting out stuff to keep the lights on. With all due respect, EFF, Cory Doctorow, or for Legal Eagle, to say on social media or on YouTube that the, oh, the OGL is a 20-year young long con, all these publishers were suckered, they never needed to sign on to the OGL in the first place, shows a horrifying ignorance of history. And when they call for these publishers to fight a legal battle against what is a ma effectively a massive megacorp that even if these publishers win, could destroy them, unless you're willing to help cover legal costs, unless you are willing to contribute staff to handle discovery, to let these publishers continue to put out books, to keep the lights on, to keep paying their staff, is frankly really condescending and is just gross. Now, I support the efforts with the new Orc license, and I am horrified by the actions that Hasbro is engaging in. But I also know that the solution for the new OGL is not to ignore the new OGL and pretend it doesn't exist. The dungeon delve requires preparation and care, and a dragon is dang a, a battle with a dragon is a dangerous and costly one, and not one to be taken lightly, and to do Treat them both frivolously is foolhardy, and that is effectively 
what EFF and Cory Doctorow are suggesting to it. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe, and also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, toss me a few bucks, also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that.